My name is James, and I recently separated from my wife Mandy. It came completely out of the blue. One day she sat me down and said that it wasn't working out between us. It's not you, it's me. I was shocked, and I tried to get more information out of her. There had to be a more specific reason, but we kept going in circles. She said that she hadn't been happy in a long time. I asked if this had anything to do with Derek, her handsome co-worker. They'd been spending a lot of time together, and I'd always had my suspicions that something was going on between them. I shouldn't have said anything, because she started shouting about how I was accusing her over nothing. The conversation didn't end well, obviously, and I packed my stuff and left. I figured I'd give her time to be alone and think about everything. I loved Mandy so much, and I didn't want to lose her. That night, I went to my brother Parker's house to crash. He told me I could stay with him as long as I needed, but after a week, he kicked me out. He said that I was depressing him, and that he needed to concentrate on his own marriage. I didn't have a lot of money saved up, and I didn't have anywhere else to go, so I ended up checking into the Rosemont Motel, which was the only motel in my budget where I could stay long term. It was on the shadier side of town, surrounded by old warehouses and the building was filthy. The only good thing about it was a small swimming pool at the back. I started taking a swim every evening after work. It was the only time when I could relax and stop thinking about Mandy. On my third night there, I met a woman at the pool. She was young and beautiful. She introduced herself as Sarah and asked how long I was staying there. I told her that I didn't know. She seemed pretty friendly, so we got to chatting and I explained that my wife had kicked me out, but I was still hoping that we'd get back together. Sarah seemed disappointed. I assumed she was interested in a quick hookup, but she didn't like the fact that I was still technically a married man. I asked her about herself. She said she was working for her brother, but she didn't get into any more specifics. She told me a little about her life, but she kept bringing the conversation back to me and my marriage. It must have really bothered her. Still, we seemed to hit it off, and she invited me to have a drink in her room. I refused at first, but she explained that nothing was going to happen between us. It was purely platonic. I agreed, and after I went upstairs to dry off and change, I knocked on her door, room 18. She greeted me wearing loose pajamas. She held a bottle of wine that was already open. I almost changed my mind and was about to leave, but she assured me that nothing was going to happen between us. We sat at her small table and started drinking. She encouraged me to keep drinking, almost like she wanted to get me drunk. I went through several glasses before I noticed that she was still on her first one. It seemed like she wasn't drinking at all, just pretending to. I started to get a really bad feeling, but I guess the alcohol was doing its trick. I didn't leave. We talked about normal stuff like movies and music, but every once in a while she'd ask me a question about Mandy. I don't know what got into me, probably the alcohol, but... I mentioned my suspicions that Mandy had cheated on me with her coworker Derek. Her eyes widened. That seemed to really intrigue her, so she started asking me more about him. I started to really trash the guy. I didn't know him that well, and despite my suspicions, I didn't have anything against him. He always acted friendly to my face, but I was so overcome by anger over my separation that I really started laying into the guy. I said that he was an idiot who was terrible at his job. I said he was slimy and unattractive. I even mentioned his bad breath. Sarah just sat there and listened, face blank. Then she slowly stood up and walked toward her dresser. You shouldn't have said that, she said. I tried to ask her what she meant, but before I could, she spun around with a pocket knife in her hand. She held it towards my face. I jumped out of my chair and backed away, tripping drunkenly over the carpet. Derek is a good man, she said. He's so much better than a loser like you. Sarah was a lot smaller and thinner than me, but she was sober and driven by pure rage. She held me down with one hand and used the other to drive the pocket knife <clears throat> deep into my shoulder. I screamed for help, but at a motel like this, no one was going to come to my rescue. I had to fend her off myself. <clears throat> she used her palm to drive the knife deeper. I guess the pain gave me the encouragement I needed. I pushed her off of me. She slammed against the wall. Before she could get back up, I kicked her in the side. The dresser was a foot away from her, and the motel's bulky old TV was right on top. I grabbed it and pushed it closer to the edge. 
I demanded to know who she was and what she wanted. I made it clear that if she didn't answer, I'd push the TV on top of her. Her knife was still sticking out of my shoulder. I was too angry to feel the pain. It should have been easy, she said. Why didn't you just keep drinking and keep your opinions to yourself? Who are you? I demanded again. I'm Derek's sister, she screamed from the floor. I work for him. What did he pay you to do? I asked. Nothing, she shouted. I pushed the TV so it was almost halfway off the dresser. If it fell on her, she'd be crushed. Fine, she said. He wanted me to get you drunk and then take some embarrassing photos. That's it. But then you started running your mouth and I couldn't stop myself. But why? Blackmail, idiot, she said. So you'd agree to the divorce. Your wife won't be with them until you sign the papers. It's nothing personal. As soon as she said that, all my anger left me. I felt this overwhelming numbness. I wordlessly walked out of the room, went to my car and drove to the hospital to get the knife removed. On the way, I called the police. Both Sarah and Derek were taken into custody. I don't know exactly what crimes they committed or what the punishment is. And I also don't know if Mandy had any idea about their plan. What I do know is that I'll find out in the trial that I never want to see my wife again. A crude air blew straight in my face when I stepped out of my room in the rundown motel where I stayed for the night. I noted the change in the atmosphere and it manifested in a dry lump in my throat, scraping its way down as I struck my chest twice to assuage the discomfort. When I had dislodged it, I coughed out an airless heave. Good heavens! I wheezed before tucking the key into the skewed keyhole. I recalled what the host had told me about the door and I quickly applied it. I stuck my finger just beneath the thin strip of the hinge and I yanked it upwards. The keyhole lodged into place, giving me a perfect strip to stick the key in fully. I turned the key and it clicked shut, the wind rushing back to remind me of its unceasing presence. I pulled the key out from the keyhole slowly when I heard the jamming of keys in motion. I turned around quickly to the other rooms beside me. I studied the door and my eyes fell on the door which I assumed the noise had come from. I paused, waiting out the final click which came to ascertain that I had not been mistaken in my guess. Yo! A raspy voice muttered in frustration as the door pulled open. What the fuck are these doors? I looked away quickly in politeness and turned around to go about my business of fetching a can of soda for my dry throat. The light in the distant building, at least half the length of a football field, offered seductive illumination which I started to amble towards. Hey, lady! Stop! The same voice came again. I assumed he was a guest, just as I was in the motel, spending the night in a layover motel, so I turned around affably to acknowledge that I had been called. The chilly wind intensified, and for a moment I suspected that the breeze had started to become stronger, an augury of the incoming storm in the starless night. My heart skipped. I was thankful that I did not have to drive through it. You are working the doors. Why? He asked as he marched towards me with visible concern on his face. No, uh, I don't. I I'm a guest just like you. I smiled as civilly as I could, even though his approach had begun to fill me with the keen sense of dread. In my assessment, he was very dark-skinned. He was athletic and had well-toned shoulders that was excellent for his clothes. His locks were heavy and they were at least shoulder length from what I could discern in the night. I was just a middle-aged white woman. I shrugged off any concerns I feared for my safety, knowing he was a guest there. He moved closer some more and I picked on a strange smell that came with his presence. It was a smell of utmost rottenness. I twitched, yet I remained in place. In my head, I could read the headlines. Racism is still well and alive in America. I shivered to think that such a headline would be up because of me. Still, I could not shake off what my senses were picking up on. The foul smell grew stronger until it overwhelmed me. I moved away from the line of the wafting odor. You silly little bitch, he cussed, immediately throwing me off. My expression was an immediate frown. My anxiety bloomed when I saw that his muscles twitched and he would race me anywhere if it came to it. In my consternation, I still wondered why he would cuss at me with such venom. I tried to make sense of it, but nothing came readily to mind. What? Do I know you? I quizzed. You saw it all, 
Now I have to kill you, he said, and the world all around me suddenly fell bleak. In the bleakness, I saw him produce a knife from a sheath on his pants, with blade stained by what I assumed was blood. My breath fell to a shallow, dry rasp. The darkness was palpable, and I felt an unseen force pull me towards the sinister being, rooting my feet to the ground so I could not escape. The dry ball that came up from my stomach returned violently. I retched and my entire being rocked with what I threw up. My sudden reaction bought me time because I saw that he hesitated. The bitter taste of my own vomit on my tongue was all it took to awaken my senses to the horrible danger in front of me. My entire being was alert to the horror of my lifetime. I spun around with agility I never knew I had in my limbs and I raced towards the host's inn. The cool air of the night had suddenly shrunk up, and even as I raced, feeling the breeze crash against my face, I was burning with panicking heat. Please, help me! I'll cut you up. You've seen it all. Don't fool me, he said. It was as though he was breathing down my ear. The horror crippled me, and my knees buckled as I ran. I was gasping in no time, and he drew close enough that I perceived his breath simmering down my neck. I ran faster in my head than my feet could carry me. Tears streamed down my face and the breeze wiped it away before it could fully form. Please, I blurted, numbed by terror. Perhaps my plea angered him, where he had been waiting for his moment because as soon as I uttered the word he struck out his hand and his knife slashed across my back. I tumbled over in a heap. All of you women deserve to die, he spat, and in his eyes he had such sincere passion. Helpless and numb, with the pain of my slashed back slowly growing, I grew agitated at the thought of my life flashing before my eyes. He rolled the knife in his hands, and it fell perfectly for a stab. Help me! I cried frantically, to no one in particular. Laying on the floor of the motel premises and staring into the starless heavens, I wondered how my life would end in seconds. With all that I had left in me, I yelled again as his knife came down ferociously. Please! The piercing reverberation of a gunshot rocked the air, and my assailant wheezed. He looked down on his chest and clutched on a smoky spot. I realized he had been shot, and I cried out. He fell backwards and away from me, clutching to his chest, and I could scarcely breathe in the frenzy. Damn you, bitch, he cried, and with those words he fell quiet. I heard the footsteps of someone racing up to me, and I turned around terrified by what had just happened. I saw the host and a look of worry on his beautiful dark-skinned face. Hey miss, you alright? He asked me once and looked at the man he had just shot dead. I nodded my head in the affirmative. Thank you sir, I managed to mutter when I could speak. It's no bother, it's all my pleasure that you are alright, he sighed in relief. You'll be needing first aid for that cut. What a nice gentleman. I checked into an old motel just outside of my town. Normally this isn't the kind of place that I'd be caught dead in, but I didn't have a choice. I had finally left my husband, Grady, and I didn't have anywhere else to go. None of my relatives lived nearby and I didn't want to stay at a hotel in town because Grady would find me. This place would be safe. At least that's what I told myself. I went to the front desk where an old man was standing. He had thick glasses that made him look bug-like, but he seemed friendly enough. He grinned, seemingly surprised to see a new guest at this time of night. He said he had a room available. I paid in cash, of course, because Grady would be able to see if I used my debit card. He asked me to sign his guest book, but I politely refused. I didn't want anything to trace back to me, not even my name in a book. It was a one-story motel, and my room was all the way at the end. I walked through the darkness, looking in all directions to make sure that Grady wasn't nearby. I passed by the swimming pool and noticed a man sitting in one of the folding chairs. It wasn't Grady, thank God, but it was a young guy who looked extremely suspicious. He was covered in tattoos and wore a stained wife beater. He smiled at me, but there was something in his eyes, something that said he wanted to start trouble. Hi, I said awkwardly. Hey, he said. Are... are you... 
but he couldn't finish the sentence. The words didn't come out. I got a really creepy vibe from him, so I waved once and then hurried off to room 13, my room. As soon as I got inside, I checked that the door was locked and breathed a sigh of relief. No one could get me in here. I didn't bring any stuff with me, not even a toothbrush, so I didn't have anything to unpack. I went to the bathroom to take a hot shower and wash off all my fears from today. The shower felt great, and I was really starting to calm down when I noticed a movement through the steamed up window. I turned off the shower and looked outside. No one was there. It was just empty woods behind the hotel. I swear I saw something. No, I saw someone. The movement definitely looked like a person walking. Right away, I knew it was that strange man with all those tattoos. He had walked around back and spied on me. It had to be him. I toweled off and put my clothes back on. Then I went back to the front door to double check that it was locked. It was, but just as I twisted on the handle, someone on the other side pounded loudly on the door. I looked through the peephole and it was that man again. His dark eyes were somehow looking right at me as if he could see me through the door. He pounded again. Go away, I shouted, but he didn't. He just stood there with the angriest look on his face. But please he stuttered, I, I couldn't finish his sentence. His expression got angrier and he pounded even harder on the door. Go away, I said again. N -n no, he answered. Something was very wrong with him. This was turning into a terrible night. I had just escaped from my psycho husband, and now I had to deal with a completely new psycho. Why did I choose this motel? Why couldn't I have gone to someplace nicer, safer? Through the people, I saw the man look all around to see if anyone was nearby. Then he dug into his pocket and pulled out a gun. He was going to shoot his way inside. I raced across the room and grabbed the phone. I dialed zero and the old man at reception answered. I told him that there was a crazy man with a gun. He needed to get somewhere safe and call 911. As I waited to hear his answer, I heard a loud gunshot right outside of my room. Then I heard a grunt of pain. Oh. I looked at my door and saw that it was still intact. He wasn't shooting his way in after all. I waited for a long moment until another bang rang out in silence. Very carefully, I walked across the hotel room and went back to the door. I knew it was stupid to get so close, but I needed to see what had happened. I looked through the people and saw that the man was still there, but he wasn't alone. There was a body at his feet. I realized with a gasp that he was standing over Grady. He'd shot Grady. I opened the door part way, the chain still latched in place. I whispered through the crack. What happened? S -s 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 Sorry, the man said. I st st stutter when I get nervous. I, I was trying to, to, to tell you that someone was sneaking around outside your room, trying to get in, but I s s stopped him. With that, I opened the door all the way and ran out. The tattooed man wasn't a threat at all. He was here to save me. I wrapped him in a big hug and thanked him. Right below us, Grady was bleeding out. There was two bullet holes in his stomach. I guess the man at the front desk had called the police, because within a minute, two cop cars pulled into the parking lot. Their sirens were blaring. I, I didn't want to sh 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 shoot him, the tattooed man said. It's okay, I told him. You were protecting me. As the police rushed towards us, I took one last look at Grady. He groaned. With his last bit of strength, he looked up at me. He opened his mouth to say something, and then he went still. I was finally free of him, and I was done being scared. <laughs>